Okay, thank you very much, Lucy, and thank you very much to uh, all of you for um, joining in. So um, what I'll do over the next um, 40 minutes or so is ideally to give you a bit of a journey into the impact that climate has had on uh, human demography and evolution. So we will um, start really from a, a very sort of uh, long um, time view, uh, thinking about the effect of climate on uh, selection of phenotypes, uh, starting from about a million years ago, uh, all the way to uh, about 10,000 years ago. We will then uh, think a bit more about um, modern humans uh, and really concentrate in the last um, sort of 100,000 years or so, uh, where we're gonna focus on the uh, effect of climate on the dynamics of hunter-gatherers uh, during their out of Africa expansion. We will then move to uh, much more recent periods uh, and start looking at uh, the effect of climate uh, on the interactions that actually these hunter-gatherers had uh, eventually with farmers. And we will see that uh, climate did play an impact uh, on that uh, relationship that uh, was there uh, be between these two groups of people. And finally, I'm gonna close with a, a little bit in a way of a fun project, um, thinking about the effect of climate still on us right now. Obviously uh, the effect of climate in terms of climate change has been uh, very much in the news. So we are aware that uh, climate has a big impact uh, potentially on our future. Uh, what I'm gonna try and discuss today though is uh, how we can actually mitigate and to what extent um, are we really adapted to climate now or is climate still uh, in a way a, a big force and we're still playing catch up uh, despite this very long relationship that we have uh, with climatic change. Um, so the work I'm going to present today, um, I'm going to use it, we quite a lot, but uh, really in reality, uh, the work has been done by uh, lots of people who have been in my group uh, as postdocs and PhD students, and here there are just a few uh, who have participated specifically uh, in the projects that I'm going to describe today. Uh, there are many more group members who have contributed to uh, various levels to the kind of studies that I'm going to present today. There are lots of collaborators uh, from uh, outside my group that have been absolutely instrumental. Um, so a kind of short glossary for the way I normally talk about things. Uh, when I say we did, is really my postdoc and grad students did it. Uh, they are the one who are doing really all the hard work. Uh, and we think uh, normally really means that someone explained it to me. Uh, I liked it. And so uh, I decided that I think that too. Um, so really a lot of credit should go to uh, the younger um, sort of early career researchers who have done uh, the bulk of the work uh, that you're going to see today. Um, the other thing to say is that the uh, studies I'm going to present today are very much based on uh, some efforts uh, from uh, my group as well, again, collaborators, uh, on building up uh, resources that allow us to look at climate through time. And so here there are a few of the papers that we put out uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, they're mostly data papers uh, where we've tried to put available all the resources that we have assembled that provide you a snapshot of, or better actually, sorry, a full overview, not quite a snapshot, but a full continuous overview as a matter of fact, uh, of climate uh, over the last 800,000 years, uh, thinking about uh, ice sheets, thinking about actual climate reconstructions and thinking how best uh, we can leverage these climate reconstructions uh, for studies in ecology and uh, archeology span and anthropology. So let's start looking at the first, um, study that we uh, are going to look at today, and that is one that we published recently looking at the effect of climate on uh, human phenotypes uh, in a way during our uh, evolution for the last million years. And so here what we did was to actually uh, think specifically about um, body size and brain size uh, in early humans and ask whether we could find some quantitative evidence uh, for various hypotheses that have been put forward um, for how climate might have affected uh, these two phenotypes. And really we focused here on uh, the climatic drivers, the obviously other hypotheses and other uh, drivers that would affect these two phenotypes. Uh, we concerned ourselves on climate because that was something that we could quantify uh, nicely. Now the literature on this particular topic uh, is uh, very broad uh, and I have to say um, quite uh, varied in the way it describes the effect of climate. Uh, so the first thing that we did was actually to um, try to come up with a simple classification of the various ideas that had been put forward 
uh, for the drivers of the evolution of uh, body size and brain size. And we came out with these uh, kind of simple schematics that you have on the screen, where we have four main types of hypothesis that look at the mechanisms by which climate might affect uh, either body or, or brain size. So the first one is an idea of environmental stress, where effectively uh, the phenotype tends to be larger in harsher conditions and uh, smaller normally in more benign conditions. So we have this idea here in a way, if we think about this as being temperature on the x-axis and say body size on the y-axis, you'd be looking at uh, something ecologically called Bergman's rule. Um, and uh, the idea there in a way is that uh, the phenotype acts in a way as a buffer to environmental stress and therefore it becomes larger uh, the more difficult the conditions are. Temperature is a classic, but you could think about other type of stresses uh, in a way, lack of risk, so, so some sort of challenging environment uh, where uh, your size could actually provide a buffer uh, or your brain, if it allows you to do uh, certain things, if it's larger, could also act as a buffer. The opposite um, mechanisms though could be going on and that's the idea of environmental constraints where actually it is in more benign conditions that you're able to develop a larger phenotype. And on the other hand, in a more challenging environment, you're constrained and therefore prevented from uh, developing that large phenotype. The next two sets of um, hypotheses um, actually look not at the, in a way, absolute values of conditions at a particular moment in time, but they actually think much more about variability over longer periods of time. And so here there is an idea where um, environmental variability uh, could act in a way uh, in similar way to environmental stress in a situation where the more variability you have, the larger your phenotype it is, and the smaller the variability, the more in a way predictable the environment is uh, here on the left, uh, the smaller you are. So again here, a larger phenotype is thought as a way to, uh, in a way buffer, uh, in this case, potentially through generations, uh, the effect of climate. And uh, the final uh, hypothesis one of environmental consistency. So here what we're thinking actually is uh, the opposite in the sense that, uh, again, if you actually need uh, resources to be able to have a large phenotype, uh, you're only able to maintain that large phenotype if you have a rather consistent environment through time, whereas if you're seeing a very fluctuating environment, uh, you might simply get wiped out uh, if you had developed a large phenotype, uh, and so that smaller phenotype eventually uh, is a better solution if you uh, don't have a predictable environment. So um, a lot of papers have been written about these various mechanisms. Several environmental variables have been brought in as uh, possible drivers uh, of these particular mechanisms. Uh, the issue is that the majority of those arguments are really verbal. So uh, what we did was to uh, try and see whether we could actually um, test these hypotheses in a quantitative way by building a pretty comprehensive database of uh, body sizes and brain sizes. Uh, this work with uh, Manu Will and uh, Jay Stock. Uh, and they had done this incredible work of actually trawling through the literature and building arguably the most comprehensive database of body and brain sizes uh, over time. So what we did was then to uh, match them up to um, our climate reconstruction and start asking questions of where do we find relationships between um, environmental variables and phenotypes in the right direction. Now, I'm not gonna to talk too much about um, the kind of parallels that we did in, in the paper, but this is something I would like to uh, highlight. One of the things that we worried about uh, in this kind of uh, study is that the data sets that you have are far from perfect uh, to ask good questions. And so what we did was actually an extensive amount of power analysis to determine to what extent our data sets were able to detect a relationship. In other words, what size relationship could be detected given the very fragmentary data that we had. The data obviously did not cover space and time in a homogeneous manner, and so we had to account for that. The other thing that we did was to actually repeat the analysis uh, many times, uh, both accounting for the uncertainties of the timing uh, that we had, uh, because obviously, especially as you go back uh, in time, your dating uh, becomes more and more uncertain, uh, as well as avoiding having too many samples 
from one particular region or period of time, uh, that would again bias your analysis. So what you'll see here is in a way the um, um, synthesized results of repeating analysis by creating many, many subsets of the data to try to balance out as, be as best as we could the design, uh, given the imperfection uh, of that uh, starting data set. So let's start with body size. What did we find for body size? Well, it turns out that for body size, there is really one and only one clear relationship that you find, and that is the relationship with uh, mean annual temperature. And what we find is that uh, that environmental stress hypothesis that we discussed before is actually the best predictor of um, body size. And effectively, we are really, really rediscovering Bergman's rule uh, over a long time period. Now, we know that Bergman's rule actually works on uh, contemporary humans. There are a number of studies that have looked at that. And here, what we see is that um, we find that relationship uh, even when we look back at mid Pleistocene Homo. So, here, what we did was to bring together um, Homo's for. Uh, that period of time, uh, just because uh, the, in a way, uh, species separations become quite tricky, uh, as well as the sample size are quite small. Uh, so we had to take uh, a decision. And so we created a taxonomic unit that is quite broad. Uh, we then, in a way, had the analysis also for uh, Neanderthals and um, Pleistocene Homo sapiens. And what we found is actually that the relationship among these three groups is exactly the same. What we find is that a model that has the same slope for those three different taxonomic units is the one that is the most parsimonious uh, at explaining the data. And so what we find here is that body size seems to have always been uh, in a way under the same type of uh, selection pressure uh, and is one where uh, larger body sizes will actually be favored uh, by um, a uh, lower temperature. When we looked at uh, brain size though, we found that the relationships were actually different and therefore the mechanisms that drive these two phenotypes are definitely not the same. We did find some evidence uh, for an environmental stress uh, idea. So if we look at net primal productivity, we found that at least for the mid Pleistocene Homo, there was actually a relationship of uh, larger brains for uh, relatively lower net primal productivity. But that relationship uh, was actually not really detected uh, in Neanderthal and definitely not in Pleistocene uh, humans. For Neanderthal, it's a little bit tricky because the actual range of neck primal productivity in which they were found is somewhat narrow, and so obviously it's difficult um, to, to test that thoroughly. Uh, but really, that relationship is valid for mid Pleistocene Homo. That's where we have some good evidence. Now, obviously, what we have here is just a relationship with a proxy variable. We don't know the exact mechanism. Uh, but it could be plausible to suggest that uh, what we're looking at here is a necessity potentially or an advantage of bigger brains uh, when in environments which require um, more complex or cooperative hunting. Because what we see is that net prime productivity is found effectively in the more open habitats um, where you tend to find megafauna. And uh, that megafauna obviously would require potentially a more uh, advanced and complex uh, type of hunting techniques. And you could think that brain size might actually help with that. Interesting enough, if you take that interpretation, uh, and I want to stress that it's just a speculation, all we have is a relationship with a particular uh, climatic quantity. Uh, but if you take uh, that line forward, it would suggest almost that once you get to Neanderthal and Homo sapiens, you reach potentially brain sizes where there isn't much of a uh, in effect, in a way of increasing it and not much of benefit uh, under that sort of um, driver. Um, the relationship that we found though to be valid um, across uh, the different taxonomic unit uh, for brain size was the one that was linked to the variability in mean annual precipitation. So here what we see is that uh, large brains seem only to be sustainable in um, um, climatic conditions where you have relatively stable and predictable precipitation. So if you have a high level of variability in precipitation over a period of 10,000 years, so there's a long period of time, uh, what you find is that you have a tendency for smaller brains, um, possibly because the expenses uh, of having that type of phenotype cannot actually be met when you have this uh, more challenging situation. So um, it's actually uh, 
sort of interesting to see that for both phenotypes, we managed to have a climatic driver. Um, the, um, the drivers are different. Uh, the other thing to say is that the amount of variation that you explain for body size is much higher compared to the variation you explain for brain size. So um, there must be many more things in a way or more important things happening for brain size compared to body size, uh, which kind of makes sense. And, and as I said before, I want to stress this, this is not to say that brain size or even body size were completely and only driven by climate. This is only to say that some of the variability that we see in brain and body size uh, can actually be explained by climate, uh, but there are probably other factors uh, which might be cultural uh, that were not counted here, and that would explain uh, the kind of uh, noise that you see around those curves. Okay, so um, let's now move to a, a more recent um, time period, and we're going to now focus on the uh, population dynamics of hunter gatherers out of Africa. And uh, to do this, we actually took a, a slightly sort of um, uh, roundabout approach in a way to try to get to the effect of climate. Uh, which was to say that maybe to try to figure out the effect of climate, we could actually use uh, some of the um, information we have about uh, the genetics of um, hunter-gatherer populations. Because if we look at the genetics of um, human groups before the advent of um, agriculture, we can see that there are a number of very uh, distinct uh, lineages that have been identified. In a way, the message from ancient DNA is that then over the last 10,000 years, you have a lot of reshuffling, especially in the context of uh, the great migrations of the Neolithic and Bronze Age, at least for Western Eurasia. Uh, and um, those uh, kind of, in a way, ancestral lineages that often get used in the analysis by geneticists as um, sort of the sources that you mix to create modern populations. Um, well, we can ask the question in a way, where do they arise? Where do they come from? How do you actually get uh, to these um, sort of rather diverge uh, lineages in various places uh, around the world? And to do this, we actually took an approach that we call uh, climate-informed uh, spatial genetic models. Um, so uh, in a very simple schematics, the idea is that you have uh, a number of uh, samples for which you have observe uh, genetics that you want to reproduce. So in, in this case, we have the separation between these different samples. So uh, what we do is we take uh, climate reconstructions through time, and uh, we think about uh, potential demographic rules that could actually affect um, the uh, species of interest, like humans in this case. So there'll be migration, there'll be growth rates, there'll be the effect of um, uh, climate on population sizes. And what we do then is we sample particular values for those parameters. We then, uh, in a way, recreate the world uh, in our computers to see what would happen to the uh, demography that goes forward in time, starting at a certain point uh, and expanding, in this case, um, out of Africa, or out of East Africa. And uh, what you can do is, based on the demography that you've created, you can then work out the genetics and ask whether the genetics that you predict uh, based on a particular set of parameters is actually compatible with what you observed. And so here, what you can see is that in some cases, we'll draw some values of these parameters which don't match reality. And in some cases, we'll actually uh, draw some parameters which gets pretty close uh, to being able to describe uh, the divergences in this case among hunter-gatherers. And so from this, you can actually draw uh, some posterior distributions that tell you about the likely values of those parameters, and that allows you to understand, uh, in a way, the effect of, of those variables. And so here, the idea is that, in a way, what we do is we figure out the effect of climate on the demography of um, modern humans by uh, recreating the genetic divergences that had appeared before uh, the big movements that happen um, during uh, after um, food production arises. So uh, the first thing to say is that we were able to uh, fit uh, the genetics. So we actually uh, took a number of samples here. Some of them are ancient uh, so that we can completely uh, ignore at that point uh, the effect of food production. Uh, some of them for areas where we don't have good ancient uh, DNA data, like Southeast Asia, where populations that were selected to be as little affected by food production as possible. It's not the ideal setup, but it's as close as we can get uh, to a good set of data. Uh, 
and um, we can recreate, uh, I guess, uh, those, um, those divergences. The first question to ask, though, when someone tells you that you have, has, they have a model that can actually recreate something is, does that model look vaguely realistic? Because obviously we could have a very strange and convoluted model that doesn't look anything like the real world and yet matches the genetics. So what we did was to ask the model to predict the population sizes that we have um, for the world right now, and uh, which you have here in blue. Uh, mind you, this is for hunter-gatherers, so this is ignoring uh, food production. Uh, and this is an equivalent reconstruction um, uh, of the world, but in a very different way. This actually comes from uh, anthropological data and uses anthropological data to try to create a map of uh, the possible population sizes of hunter-gatherers uh, right now. And as you can see, uh, the genetic inferred sizes actually follow a pattern is very, very similar to the one that you get uh, when you use anthropological data. So this is some work by Mika Talavara and it's fantastic little bit of work. Uh, and the match is actually really good. Um, so um, the first thing in a way sort of uh, tick here is, uh, does this look uh, realistic? Uh, and the answer is yes, it, it does look uh, realistic. So what does the model then say about the various sort of interesting uh, processes that climate might have had on the um, dynamics of um, out, hunter gatherers out of Africa? So the first thing that we find is actually the model is very fussy uh, about a parameter that we call critical precipitation, which is the minimum amount of precipitation required for humans to actually uh, be able to exist. And what you find is that despite giving them a pretty sort of broad uh, flat prior, the posterior, the values that the model select as matching the genetics well, are actually very narrow. And they are in this range of uh, just over 100 to about sort of 115 uh, millimeters of rainfall per year. And uh, if you look at what happens in terms of the um, ability of humans to uh, move in and out of Africa, um, this is actually a, a very interesting range because effectively, if you require uh, too much rainfall, uh, you never come out of Africa. So here, here what we have is through time, uh, when, how much rain do you need to come out of Africa? And effectively, if you need here more than, for example, 120 meter rainfall, you never come out of Africa. And uh, in some periods, you need to be particularly drought tolerant. In some periods, you got um, definitely uh, more rain and therefore it's easier to come out. And what we find is that the um, level that the models select is actually not one where you necessarily always come out of Africa. It actually is a period when that connectivity between Africa and out of Africa is actually broken down repeatedly. So you need this kind of intermittent connection uh, to Africa uh, to actually get uh, some good separations uh, in terms of genetics. Now that quantity actually that we uh, get is actually a really interesting one because this amount of rainfall is the one that as a sort of uh, macro uh, climate level uh, you would need for exeric shrubland. So this is actually pretty much the threshold between a desert and when you start actually having some vegetation. Now, a thing to say is that uh, these kind of models and these kind of reconstructions are very much based on the kind of large scale. So our cells tend to be in the order of about 150 kilometers wide. So um, this is not to say that in a small patch where all you get is 100 millimeters of rainfall, people will necessarily survive. This is to say that in an area where over 100 kilometers, you get on average 100 millimeters of rainfall per year, there will be enough suitable habitat, which might only be the valleys or the particularly good places, but that kind of region of about 100 odd 50 kilometers will be good enough for people to survive. Now, interesting enough, uh, this kind of amount is an amount that uh, also has uh, some meaning if you look at a number of other quantities. So this is an analysis that we did um, recently, uh, looking at, for example, uh, the um, um, presence of um, contemporary hunter-gatherers and the precipitation. And so what you see here is that the histogram represents the kind of um, um, levels of precipitation that hunter-gatherers uh, live in right now. And obviously that's a very biased subset of hunter-gatherers. But what you find is that there is a big drop uh, below about 100 millimeters of rainfall, 90 to 100. I mean, we use 90 here, because again, that is actually the real threshold uh, between a desert and exterior sharp land, according to uh, quite a few um, vegetation models. 
And you see that there are three populations uh, of contemporary hunter-gatherers that live below that level. Uh, I'm afraid they cheat because if you look at it, what they do is actually live in places where there are other sources of water. So they don't have to rely on the general uh, amount of rainfall that comes in, but they actually can rely on um, underground water that comes up and at that point that allows them to survive in particularly dry places. Uh, the other thing that we find is that that threshold actually corresponds very nicely to uh, the point where you just don't have any more grazer biomass. So obviously grazer are potentially very important source of food uh, for uh, humans, for hunter gatherers. And what we find is that that relationship, again, is very much linked to uh, where you would still find some uh, biomass from grazers that you could use uh, as food. Now, if we use this kind of thresholds and actually ask the question of when can people come out, uh, this is what we did in this paper that looked in a way at the windows of opportunity south of Africa. Uh, so this is looking at the northern and the southern route uh, and when you can come out. And so here what you have is that band of, of about um, sort of 90 millimeters of rainfall and um, the, the kind of possibilities. And as you can see, there are a number of windows where we have um, uh, definitely uh, the ability to come out. It's actually easier to come out from uh, the southern route in principle. Uh, the problem that there you actually have to cross um, it is straight and that might uh, not always be possible. So uh, this is more the kind of an opportunity from a climatic uh, perspective, if you were to able to cross uh, uh, the Red Sea. Uh, on the other hand, on the Northern route is more straightforward. Um, I guess a really interesting point is that we published this paper and literally a few days afterwards, uh, a paper came out from uh, uh, Hugh Grosher and his group uh, showing that actually in um, the Arabian Peninsula, just about an area actually that we also predict to be pretty good uh, for people through time. Uh, every time there is one of these big peaks, they actually have uh, a, some remains uh, that match quite nicely the key periods uh, that we have suggested should be suitable. Uh, the interesting point to some extent is if you look at this out of Africa, at least in these climate reconstructions, we fail to find an opportunity for a northern route. It's really sort of focusing on a southern route as the more plausible way uh, to come out. Um, we don't know in a way where, where the um, people that were found in, in Arabia uh, at about uh, sort of that period of time actually came from. Uh, and so I think in a way we're still a bit in the dark, um, but at least according to the climate reconstructions that we have, uh, we would actually favor more of a role of a Southern route rather than Northern route. So um, another important feature of the environment that really affects uh, what um, people did on mountains and so here what you have is a reconstructions of the lines of how gene flow uh, actually moves uh, through the system. And what you can see is the important role, for example, that the Caucasus has in shutting down to a good extent uh, gene flow uh, compared to some of the other routes that you have. So here you can see that the main lines of gene flow go left and right in the separation between uh, Europeans and Asians. And actually the Caucasus acts as a big barrier which is in line with the uh, genetic uh, sort of isolation of the Caucasus hunter-gatherers uh, in their area. You can see how uh, mountains and deserts potentially affect the flow. So here you can see gene flow going above and below the Himalayas and the Gobi Desert that act together as being a major barrier. In a way, we know that even from uh, analysis of contemporary humans, uh, but we can see that we can pick that up uh, from just a number of um, hunter-gatherer genomes uh, quite clearly. And finally, you can see places where, um, on the other hand, mountains are just not big enough to be uh, a barrier, because here what you can see is that the Urals, on the other hand, contrary to the Himalayas and the Caucasus, actually don't really seem to play much of a role in uh, decreasing the gene flow. And you can see that the gene flow here is pretty uh, thorough. So what we find is that the model does not select uh, the kind of low mountains like the Urals as acting as a major barrier uh, for gene flow. Finally, cold climates have an important uh, role. Uh, now we know from archeology span that in principle, people can survive very cold climates. So this is a, an example of uh, Yana, uh, and uh, that is basically uh, a, uh, um, an individual that definitely was in one of the coldest places that you can imagine uh, about 32,000 years ago. So uh, people were definitely able to uh, persist uh, in places which were quite cold. And so what we tend to find is according to that, our model also predicts some level of persistence in a way throughout time, uh, for example, for the Beringian Strait, 
Uh, but one thing that you do see is that the population densities in those areas are predicted to be extremely low. Um, so yes, in this case, the model in a way uh, has to and matches the fact that there are some people in very cold places at 32,000 years ago, but the genetics pushes for those populations to be very, very thin on the ground. Uh, on the other hand, what we do find is that uh, the area here of Beringia, which has been suggested as potential uh, a refugium in a way uh, for people during the colder periods, does definitely have uh, larger population sizes. And so again, when you then look at the gene flow uh, that the model is um, producing, it actually passes uh, through this kind of corridor at the very beginning of the colonization of the Americas. And it really has a, a sort of a major source uh, in that refugium in Beringia. So according to the climate reconstructions and uh, the genomes, they would actually favor uh, a Beringian standstill of at least a certain um, sort of size. Okay, so um, climate definitely had a big effect on uh, shaping, in a way, the um, patterns of genetic diversity in humans throughout the world before um, agriculture. What happens when agriculture starts? So um, what we're interested in specifically was that from uh, genetics, uh, we uh, know that there was definitely some mixing between the early farmers that came into Europe uh, and the local hunter-gatherers, but that uh, mixing was far from being homogeneous and uh, both in space and time. So what we asked was whether we could actually find, uh, again, a, a potential uh, signal of climate and therefore a mechanism that might explain the heterogeneity. So the first thing that we did was actually try and quantify uh, the spread of uh, agriculture. And so what Leah Betty, together with a number of collaborators, did was try to put together as comprehensive as possible uh, a data set of um, sites uh, of where the Neolithic arrived. In this case, the Neolithic was defined very specifically in terms of food production rather than any other uh, sort of cultural um, marker. So pottery here is not enough to be Neolithic. We're really talking about the food, the, the expansion of food production, one should say, of the Neolithic rather than the broader Neolithic culture definition. And if you take all the sites with their radiocarbon dates and uh, you use an algorithm that we developed to try to um, highlight what are the major routes of expansion, uh, this is what you get here. So you have a route that is mostly coastal. Uh, you have a route that cuts across the um, center of uh, Europe and then splits into two. And then you have um, one that goes more uh, to the east. And the interesting thing is that if we then look at the movement along this major channel, so what you tend to see when you look at the uh, sites is that you tend to have mostly movement along these channels and then a kind of an expansion sideways as the map eventually gets filled in. And the interesting thing is that for three out of these four routes, uh, what you see is that the speed is very fast at the beginning, but it eventually slows down. So this is not the case for the um, um, blue route, which effectively goes very fast until it hits uh, the Atlantic Ocean and obviously doesn't go any further. But for the other two routes, there is actually a slowdown. And the interesting thing is that the slowdown here is, doesn't occur when they actually reach the uh, coastline, but it actually starts earlier than the coastline. And it also uh, happens here where there are no coastlines whatsoever. But actually what is in common for these uh, uh, three uh, slowdowns, if you look at it, is that they happen to be in the parts of the map with the same color. And in this case, the color that you see on the map is based on what are called growing degree days. So growing degree days is a measure that is normally used in agriculture to define the suitability of climate uh, for growing certain crops. And so what we see here is that the slowdown occurs uh, regularly uh, when we get to um, this particular um, sort of climatic situation. And that climatic situation is just below 2000, between 1500 and 2000 growing degree days. Now, um, this is an interesting measure because even now actually, uh, that amount is uh, a key um, quantity uh, to define how easy it is to grow crops in, um, Sort of temperate climates. Uh, so it seems to be still now uh, a, a well-known threshold where you have to actually change the type of crops 
uh, once you pass that threshold. And so here, what you can imagine is that that slowdown might well be due to the fact that you're coming out with a certain Neolithic package of crops uh, that is working quite well in climates which are not too different from the era where you developed. Uh, but as you uh, start approaching uh, northern climates where that growing season in a way is not as good, that is actually what slows you down. Interesting enough, if you repeat the same analysis with different environmental variables, the harshness of winter is not a good predictor of those slowdowns. It's actually the, how good the summer is that really matters. And growing degree days is the best explanator of uh, that particular slowdown. So there seems to be something happening here in terms of climate uh, in a way uh, impacting the ability of uh, people to uh, uh, reach certain areas. Um, it has to be noted that after a period of slowdown, the expansion restarts. And uh, there are suggestions that that uh, sort of restart might actually be due to changes in the crops and the timing of sowing the crops. In a way, people eventually adapted their package uh, to those kind of harsher climates but it looks like it, there was a stasis, there was a period of time that it took. And interesting enough, uh, that period of time is somewhat different uh, between the different, um, um, the different streams that you have um, into uh, Western Eurasia. What we then asked was to, whether uh, we could actually see some relationship between uh, this kind of slowdowns, this kind of climates that are challenging and the uh, mixing that we see between uh, hunter-gatherers and farmers. Uh, and the answer is yes, actually growing degree days is not a bad predictor for the contribution of uh, hunter-gatherers into Neolithic farmers. So you hear what you have is all the uh, samples that we had. And for, so for each individual, we actually estimated the proportion of contribution that uh, came from hunter-gatherers. And so what you see is that there is definitely a pattern of uh, an increase in contribution of hunter-gatherers as your growing degrees are going down. And actually there seems to be very much an effect around that uh, sort of threshold of 1500 to 2000 growing degree days. Now, um, here in a way, the, the pattern is quite messy. You have uh, two things going on because uh, what you can see is also that the points have been color, color coded for how long the Neolithic has been in a certain place because the longer the Neolithic is in a place, uh, the more uh, there has been time for hunter-gatherers and farmers to mix. And indeed what we see is that over time, there is an increase in the proportion of hunter-gatherer contribution uh, into uh, Neolithic genomes. And so here you have both that temporal pattern with darker points uh, being found uh, higher up on the plot, uh, but also you have that uh, increase in relationship uh, between um, uh, harshness of the summer and the proportion of hunter-gatherers. So what could because what could be actually um, generating that pattern? Well, um, in a way, there are two things that come to mind. One is that uh, it could be a numbers game. So you could have a situation just where as you're going north, as the climate becomes more challenging, you have fewer farmers. And uh, those fewer farmers, therefore, uh, in a way, are uh, more affected by any mixing that you have uh, with um, hunter-gatherers. On the other hand, there might be also uh, a more active uh, sort of, in, um, in a way, uh, interaction with hunter-gatherers, because what you find is that in areas where the farmers are struggling, uh, they will uh, probably need to rely more on uh, hunting and gathering uh, themselves, and therefore they would actually come more into contact with hunter-gatherers and potentially know, need the know-how of those hunter-gatherers more. Um, what we tried was actually to use those um, climate-informed models to see to what extent uh, the um, this kind of numbers game, these differences in population sizes uh, could explain the patterns of admixture between hunter-gatherers and farmers I've just shown you. So here what we have is a data set, and this is much less noisy because rather than being all individuals, these are actually population samples where we have multiple individuals. And so these points now start representing, um, in a way, uh, groups of individuals. And so we've reduced that noise uh, that we had in the previous plot. And uh, what we asked was whether we could actually build up those models of expansion where we have our underlying hunter-gatherer layer that I've shown you uh, for the previous study, uh, but we now overlay a second layer of farmers that come out. And uh, what happens if we try to look at a relationship uh, between a growing degree days and population sizes of farmers that would actually match the genetics. And it turns out that you do get a signal and it's a pretty clear signal uh, where we find indeed that 
uh, population sizes for farmers uh, tend to be affected by growing degree days uh, in a pattern where actually uh, between, in a way, 1,000 and 2,000 growing degree days is where you have the sharpest change in population sizes. And that effectively explains uh, and, and actually matches quantitatively quite nicely uh, those proportion of admixture uh, that we see uh, here. Uh, and they seem to mostly be arising uh, by these numbers games of having uh, larger farming populations in more benign climates uh, and smaller populations in more uh, challenging uh, climates. And the smaller populations therefore end up with a higher admixture uh, sort of impact uh, of the local hunter-gatherers. Roughly speaking, the population of uh, hunter-gatherers, I haven't got them plotted here, but it would be about down here in size. And so uh, what you'd see effectively is that uh, until you get to relatively uh, harsher uh, climates, the farmers are, are so many compared to the hunter-gatherers uh, that the hunter-gatherers just really don't have much of an impact. Uh, obviously, if you wait long enough, if you wait several thousand years, that effect can go up and can ratchet up a little bit, uh, but it does so slowly and it takes time. Okay, so if climate has had an impact on, um, in a way, very early um, homo, uh, very early humans, uh, the kind of mid Pleistocene homo, uh, all the way to um, the farmers, uh, what about us today? Have we actually, in a way, um, freed ourselves of the effect of climate, or uh, are we still in a way victims of our evolutionary past? So we actually adapted to climate uh, better. You could imagine now that with uh, industrialization, uh, we might have actually sorted ourselves out, uh, selected the right crops, uh, and in a way removed this big effect of climate uh, that we had uh, in the past. Um, so this is a bit of fun work that um, Robert Bayer, a postdoc in my group, um, headed. And what we did was to actually take the um, current distribution of crops um, around the world and uh, look at, in a way, how optimal, how uh, well-placed uh, these um, crops are. So here what you have is the distribution of uh, pasture and cropland. And what you have is effectively the impact that they have right now in terms of the CO2 impact, the carbon impact, the biodiversity impact that we have, um, in terms of uh, range rarity, which is a good measure of uh, how much you're impacting species with giving particular emphasis uh, to species that got small ranges and therefore the more you impact them, uh, the, the more sort of dramatic that effect is and how much water we actually need. So um, this is the current state of affairs at the moment. So we've normalized for what we're using right now in terms of water and how much uh, of an impact we have on biodiversity and how much CO2 uh, we're actually producing out of these agricultural uh, activities. And then we asked the question, well, could we do better? And um, here Robert came out with a very um, clever way of actually optimizing uh, the distribution. You have to consider uh, several tens of crops, uh, each of which can be moved in different places. And obviously, if you're growing one crop, so you cannot grow another crop. And so there are actually um, uh, a very large number of combinations. Uh, and uh, you can do come out with actually an optimal solution to it. And we were quite stunned when we uh, looked at our optimal solution, uh, because it turns out that you could really change the footprint of people around the world. You could effectively go for um, um, a kind of extreme land sparing approach uh, where you are concentrating a, a lot of your crop uh, and, and pastures uh, to relatively few locations. And the potential impact of that is actually staggering. So in principle, you could actually grow all the food that we're growing now without using a single rain, a single drop of rainwater. Uh, you could decrease your biodiversity impact by 90%, and you could turn back the clock on CO2 uh, by a couple of decades and reduce the impact by 62%. Now, the question though is how realistic is this kind of um, optimization. I mean, in a way, this is possibly la la land. You're saying that you're going to have a fully globalized world uh, where you only grow crops or uh, have livestock in the best possible places. Um, that's in a way quite unrealistic. Can we really be that um, sort of globalized? Uh, probably not. The next question that we asked was, um, though, how could we do if we did everything within country? So if we were to ask each country to reorganize their crops so they keep growing what they're growing now, but they grow in a way in the better places more efficiently, um, how good would that be? How, how big would the benefits be compared to this kind of 
a globalized optimal world? And actually the answer is that it could still be pretty good. So if you just optimize within each country, uh, you find that you could uh, still pretty much uh, avoid using uh, any rainwater for crops. Uh, your biodiversity impact could go down by 79% rather than 90%. That's still pretty good in my books. And your impact in terms of your uh, carbon impact could still be at 44%. Now, there are still big challenges, even for this kind of uh, scenario, because it, you are again asking to concentrate all your agriculture in a few areas within countries. Uh, and that obviously has got big sort of societal uh, challenges. Um, but I guess the first message to take away here is that uh, in principle, we could do much better at how we feed the world, uh, given the kind of footprint that we have on the world at the moment. So a lot of in a way of our footprint is really a kind of uh, cultural inheritance of where people have been growing crops uh, over the centuries. And uh, there are many other options uh, that could be better. Um, the other good news, uh, and having got a slide for this one uh, handy, unfortunately, is that uh, we started now looking at um, how much do you need to reorganize to get these benefits. And it turns out that actually just moving the most offending so 10% to 5% of locations in each country could actually have huge benefits without the kind of uh, whole scale reorganization of countries that this latter scenario would still require. So in principle, by moving uh, about 10% of agricultural land, that's still a lot, uh, but in a way that feels more achievable to me within a country, you could still reap about 30% of the benefits that you'd have here with a transnational optimized distribution that you could argue is just utopia and so very unlikely to work. So I would say that we were quite uh, stunned by how optimistic to some extent some of the pictures here are. There's still big challenges and these are definitely uh, uh, not trivial ones that you can't simply solve with an optimization algorithm of how do you deal with kind of a stakeholder uh, impact if you were to do some of these reorganizations. But definitely in terms of future agricultural policy, uh, that's something that should be uh, considered. And, and definitely there is a scope here for uh, humans potentially being able to live in a planet uh, without actually completely obliterating it. So um, hopefully I've convinced you that climate has had uh, an impact on us uh, starting from our uh, pretty early uh, evolution uh, from mid Pleistocene Homo onwards. Uh, it's impacted then hunter-gatherers and farmers later on, and it's still here as a kind of uh, inheritance for us uh, at the moment, uh, and we're far from having uh, removed the shackles of the effects of climate uh, on our population dynamics, it's still very much uh, affecting us, uh, and we're definitely not that well optimized, we definitely haven't uh, sort of um, moved away from those historical um, sort of constraints. So um, thank you very much for listening. Again, as a reminder, uh, all the work that I've mentioned claim for myself has really been done by the early career researchers in my group and they deserve uh, really most of the credit. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Andrea. That was absolutely fascinating. So many uh, interesting studies and lots to think about. Um, please could you stop sharing your screen and we'll um, go into the Q&A. So um, remember, you can put your questions um, in the chat or you can raise your hand um, and ask out loud. Uh, Matt, do you want to go first? Well, hi, Andrea. Um, that, was, that was fantastic. Um, I, I was just actually going back to the first case study. I wonder if you could you use terms like variability and predict, predictability sort of interchangeably. And I, I wonder, if, it, if you could distinguish between the two. So um, an environment depicted by a sine wave and by white noise could both be variable, but only one would be predictable. I wonder if it would be, if you could distinguish and if you think it might be useful to. Um, absolutely. So in, in a way, the, the time scale we're looking at was the kind of 10,000 year time scales. And you're perfectly right that we're really, we were looking at variability. And I've, I've used the two terms interchangeably in a rather, I guess, slightly sloppy way, to be completely honest about it. Um, I think, in a way, if you do have a, a sine wave and that sine wave is quite slow, you could imagine that the population might actually adapt and you, you see less the effect, whereas uh, the kind of um, more white noise that you're describing uh, 
obviously is the one that's more challenging because when we're looking at 10,000 years, you're mostly thinking potentially about almost an environmental filter that removes populations with certain phenotypes in a way they find themselves by having the wrong phenotype at the wrong time and they disappear. And the ones that have the right phenotype manage to persist through the up and downs. They might not be the best in a way adapted all the time, but they are the one that we eventually find after 10,000 years. And that's more in a way what we were trying to look at. Um, I guess it's difficult to, to distinguish between the two uh, fully because uh, even with this kind of uh, climate reconstructions, uh, we are really capturing a kind of millennial level uh, time scale variability. So we don't know at the generation level, which is really what would matter, to what extent that variability is white noise versus a more kind of sinusoidal uh, curve as you're describing it. And I think unfortunately we're still far away from having climate reconstructions that would really capture that on say a 10,000 year time scale going all the way back to even 100,000 years ago, let, let alone a million. Um, but I think, yeah, there is definitely, we were very much taking a, a very broad brush uh, quantity. And I think the details of that uh, dynamics uh, would on the other hand then affect, uh, change the kind of final effect that you'd see at the particular location for a particular time period. Thank you, Matt. Um, are there any more questions for Andrea? Uh, Lisa? Hello, uh, thanks Andrea, that was that was really fascinating. I'd like to go back to the beginning of your talk um, as well about the brain and body size. And I'm slightly uh, conflicted here because when I put on my anthropology hat, I think mostly these traits in that time period are kind of seen as kind of a gradual progress through time. And I'm not sure that this is how we should Look at these traits, but definitely this is how how you know what the kind of the, the general trends are pretty clear. So are you somehow controlling for time just to make sure that basically the trends you are observing are not simply um, kind of background correlation with, with 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 time, even though it might be kind of partly climatically driven. But you know, I think the general view in kind of paleoanthropology is that there are some other intrinsic reason why we why we see the kind of the brains expanding and not really going smaller on the grand so um, a, scale of things yeah so i think there is a, there is a um you know there is an advantage of the the kind of time period that we focus on the kind of eight hundred thousand years uh, period because that's when you have all the glacial cycles and so actually at that point you see that in a way climatically there isn't such in a way the, the kind of the more uh, gradual, uh, you know, changes that you link quite nicely to, say, temperatures over a long period of time, you have to go further back and actually go before the big glacial cycles and the, the, the Milankovitch cycles. Um, so the period that we're looking at is actually a period where climate is going up and down quite dramatically. Um, so in a way, that kind of provides a nice natural experiment because you are, there isn't a kind of a nice, um, you know, gradual change in temperature. Um, the other thing is, in a way, the um, so we tried at some point having just time as a, as a plain variable and does actually very badly on, on, on those time scales. Also, because though, and, and that's why we eventually decided as, to present as, as we as we did is uh, by dividing the, the those kind of three taxonomic units, you're then again breaking down time and effectively, you know, within Neanderthal, at that point, in a way, you're looking at the changes or the differences in brain size within Neanderthal, within the late Pleistocene um, humans, and the mid Pleistocene Homo, which are the more problematic ones because they cover a longer period of time and potentially some of the kind of between species changes that in a way are more you know, traditionally talked about. Um, so I think the fact that you then recapture those signals rather nicely for the majority of the variables within Neanderthal and within uh, the late Pleistocene Homo um, shows that that's not just this big gradual change um, but that's not to say that there isn't also, to some extent, a progressive change. Uh, I think I said over the longer evolutionary time periods, say two million years, two and a half million years, there is that very clear change. And that's really difficult to disentangle from climate because you're also seeing a complete change in the kind of uh, climate system uh, from a, a much more stable climate to the glaciations. And so, and the two are really hard to kind of disentangle at that point. Uh, on these sort of shorter timescales, and especially when you go towards the, the two latter taxonomic units, uh, 
you're actually looking at a period when, in a way, you're doing a, a, you know, a, a full uh, up and down uh, if you're looking at the, the late Pleistocene Homo, because you're going from an interglacial to an interglacial. So in a way, you're going up and down. Uh, and that actually breaks that time climate correlation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the, and there's reason, to, um, I think it was a, uh, earlier this autumn, a paper came out about the uh, body size variability and the, I think it's a, a growth hormone um, um, regulated gene that is, um, that is um, uh, variable in modern humans, but seems to be fixed in uh, Denisovans and Neanderthals. I think it would be very interesting to compare to your results. Uh, but I'll, um, I'll let other people ask questions. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Walter. Um, if global warming is not checked, how could the optimal distribution areas of crop growing and grazing be affected as so many critical areas will be underwater? So that's a very good question. I'd say the answer is uh, both good news and really boring from a scientific perspective, which is um, we actually looked at how much the, um, the kind of optimal um, plan that we create for current climate would be looking at sort of in 50 or 100 years. And the answer is it would still be doing absolutely fine. So the changes in climate that you will see in a way uh, over the next hundred years are quite small compared to the, in a way, how suboptimal the current distribution is. So when you start redistributing uh, those crops, uh, there's actually pretty much nowhere where you start putting things that would not sort of function in a hundred years time, as long as you don't go to the real extreme, you know, four and above degrees changes in climate. Uh, at that point, I would argue all bets off. Uh, so in that perspective, uh, the, the kind of, uh, in a way, the level of suboptimality that we have is so big uh, that compared to climate change is not a big deal. Uh, now, obviously, there is a big caveat on that, which is we're not, so what we're assuming there is that we would still want the same amount of food in 100 years time uh, with the same distribution of crops and so on. Uh, and we've actually looked at and tried to talk to a few collaborators on whether we could make good predictions of what people might want in 50, 100 years time? And the answer is just, we can't, we got absolutely no idea. Uh, so we decided not to go there just because it would just be plucking numbers out of the hat and who knows. Um, in terms of places going underwater again, it's, you know, if you are a coastal area, that's um, really bad news, but in a way you're, um, it's actually not such great expanses of land uh, that go underwater. And in this case, uh, for the areas that we, the algorithm ends up choosing, uh, the situation is not too bad at all. So say this pl the plan in principle could be made pretty much uh, climate change proof. Uh, There's not to say that there are not lots of other issues that climate change will bring. Um, the one thing also that we didn't consider to be, to be fair is the, um, um, you know, we looked again at sort of the kind of the main mean climatological uh, conditions that you find. Uh, there are obviously arguments for uh, potential instability of climate that increases uh, with increases in CO2. Uh, and again, those are quite difficult to, to model. And those are not fully accounted in our predictions of where would you put crops. So in a way, if you continuously have hailstorms, uh, you might be able to grow the crops if the hailstorms were not there. But if they keep happening, or if you have obviously large amounts of wildfires that you can't stop, uh, they will scupper the plan uh, pretty badly. Uh, so this is definitely not to say that uh, the plan would kind of override climate change, but more in terms of, um, uh, in a way, bridging the gap between uh, where we're growing stuff now and when we could grow it, uh, we could actually uh, do that uh, rather nicely without too much of it of a cost, and that would be future proof. Very interesting. Thanks, Walter, for the question. Um, so it is now two o'clock, so I think we'll call it a day there. Thank you very much, Andrea, for um, the excellent and very interesting talk. And thank you everybody for coming. Um, next week, we have a webinar with Manuel Will, uh, who I believe uh, uh, co-authored and led some of the papers discussed today. Um, but he's going to be talking about coastal adaptations and human evolution. So thank you again, Andrea, and hopefully see you all next week. Thank you very much. Bye, nice to see you.